I love cooking and I love teaching people how to cook. Good food is so important, not just for our health, but for our temperament, and it doesn't need to be complicated. For this series, I've created a set of menus which I hope you will try, either as individual dishes or as a complete and balanced meal. We're so lucky to have some of the best raw ingredients in the world. Let's make the most of them. Some people say that cauliflower is a new kale. Either way, when roasted with lots of red onion and spice, this vegetable, perceived sometimes as being ordinary and not exotic, is really transformed into something wonderful and modern. On the other hand, the recipe for the muhammara is an ancient one from the Middle East. The preparation for this dish can be done several hours in advance. The dish is good served straight from the oven or at room temperature. So I'm going to begin by roasting the vegetables for the muhammara. This is a wonderful dip. Today we're going to have it with roast cauliflower, but another day it'd be lovely with grilled fish or meat, uh, just spread over grilled bread. It's a fantastic thing. So um, I've got some whole cloves of garlic, six whole cloves, which seems like a lot, but actually we're roasting them, so they're going to be lovely and mild, and we'll pop them out of their skins a little bit later on. And these all go on a tray. So some cherry tomatoes. Then I've got um, a red pepper, which I'm going to just half quarter de-seed and then cut into coarse pieces. This is all going to be blitzed or pureed later, so you don't have to make a very fine chop of the vegetables at this stage. And a an red onion, sort of coarsely chopped. And if you want to, you can just break the onion up a little bit smaller than that. A little olive oil on here and a little salt and pepper. And that's everything. It couldn't really be much easier. It really couldn't. It's a terrific, terrific thing. Okay, pop that in, get them nice and roasted and charred and collapsing. Now, the next thing is I can prepare my cauliflower. With the cauliflower, I, I like to get as many of the green leaves as possible. Now, I'm just going to cut it like that. A bit extravagant looking to start off with. And then I will use as many of these green leaves in the dish as I can. I'm totally happy to roast those with the flour of this particular vegetable as well. Then just break up the cauliflower. So what I do next is I turn it upside down, cut out the tough stalk out of the middle. You could just cut it in quarters, but again, I kind of like doing this, so that's what I do. You get that sort of cone shape like that. And then it breaks up pretty easily, he says, struggling with it. Depending on the size of the cauliflower, if the florets are too big, you can just cut some of them in half. Cauliflower is delicious, just very, very thinly sliced, just as a raw salad. So that's the cauliflower. Red onion is going to add a sort of a piquant uh, nature to this particular dish and plenty of flavor. The color of the red onion is so beautiful as well. Right, they are going in there. This is going to be a tight squeeze, not to worry. So I've got three teaspoons of roasted and ground cumin a good pinch of salt to flavor everything. So about six tablespoons of olive oil for one cauliflower. And one final ingredient, which may seem a bit strange with cauliflower, but lemon and the zest of a lemon. But again, when you think about cumin, lemon, olive oil, you know, you can see how that's sort of starting to make sense. The color is already look pretty fantastic. Now I've got in such a big bowl, I think it's going to be easier for me actually just to pop it onto my tray and give it a good mix while it's on the tray. And the best thing to do here, I think, is get my hands in. So I want to get that lemon through, the cumin through, and the seasoning. They will shrink a bit, of course, when they're in the oven, so it'll look like slightly less when it comes out. But it's already like a tray of really delicious food. Cauliflower is cooked. You need to be brave with the cauliflower and allow it to get plenty of colour so that it gets really nicely roasted like that. The leaves, remember which we put in, have collapsed completely, but they've been completely, really delicious. And the red onion gets sort of slightly caramelised. I'm absolutely happy with the texture, colour and the amount that that is cooked. And in this oven here, we have our muhammara ingredients. And as you can see, ouch, hot tray. Uh, we like to get them quite charred as well. That is a very important part of the flavour. So we can go ahead and finish this. So I'm going to decant all of those 
I'm going to take the cloves of garlic off there first though, because we're going to remove the skin from the garlic, which by now will have softened. So into a food processor, use a handheld blender, but honestly, food processor is much better here. So that goes there. The garlics, we just pop them out of their skin and they will blend down to a really delicious puree. They're so lovely like that. Great. Okay, so the walnuts, so we've just toasted these walnut halves on a dry pan. So slightly crispy at this stage and that will also have elevated the flavor and the texture of those. So they go in. One teaspoon of ground and roast cumin seed. One teaspoon of smoked paprika, preferably smoked paprika here. Then two tablespoons of the syrupy pomegranate molasses. It is that lovely sort of Middle Eastern combination of flavors. Olive oil, also two tablespoons of olive oil. And we'll whiz that up and we get a lovely, really deep color from the roasted vegetables. Pinch of salt. Great. Now, puree. Well, that's starting to look lovely. Look at those colors, absolutely fabulous, like sort of, almost sort of burnt earth. So take some of the um, muhammara, and then I'm going to spread it like this, just on the base. This is for serving with the cauliflower. So, this is our cauliflower. So just give it a stir. It just gets glazed by the oil. I'm going to build it up. I'm not trying to recreate the shape of the cauliflower again, but it will have some sort of a reference to the original shape. Some pomegranate seeds, just a few, like that. Some chopped green olives, olive and cauliflower, fabulous combination. And then a few coriander leaves, which is the lovely, the perfect herb here. And that makes a wonderful starter. I think this is sensational food. Simple enough between the jigs and the reels, but a really, really nice thing. I really like grilling as a method of cooking because it's a great way to achieve lots of crispy skin and plenty of color. And we all know that color equals flavor. In this next dish, chicken pieard with roasted grapes and almonds, the cooked grapes may seem like a bit of a novelty, but when they are combined with the almonds and the rosemary, they draw all of the flavors together in a really lovely way. Roasting the grapes is very straightforward. So I've got some of the grapes in little individual sort of bunches like that, and then some of the grapes I have removed from the stalk, little individual ones, and I'm using seedless grapes. So all we need here is some olive oil and quite a bit of olive oil because the olive oil here becomes part of the sauce when it's combined with the juice of the roast grapes a little bit later on. Some salt and pepper. And then the herb that I'm using with the grapes are some thyme leaves. I just pull some of the leaves off the thyme and then I usually just throw in those stalks like that. Give it a little stir around and onto a little dish. And I can use that bowl in a moment for tossing the chicken breasts before they go onto the grill pan. So we'll get the last little bit of olive oil out of that. Great. They will take about between 20 and 30 minutes, a surprising length of time actually for the grapes to roast. And the combination of roasting and steaming there will be absolutely perfect. Now I'm going to join the chicken to make the chicken pieard, as they're called, essentially what is a butterfly chicken breast. You can, of course, buy chicken breasts if that's what you'd like. I have a whole chicken here, and then I'll save the drumsticks, the carcass, the wings for another day. So we start off by just removing the legs. So cut between the drumstick and the breast. And remember, when you're jointing a chicken, generally speaking, you're pretty much always going south. So cut down between the breast and the chicken, like that, and keep going south, and keep your knife right in against the carcass. When you reach an impasse, don't crunch your way through because you'll be only blunting your knife. Just click. So you're separating the ball from the socket. Then it's easy to get behind there. And with the oyster, if you want, you can turn it on its side like that and just slide that lovely little oyster piece out and that comes along with the leg. So those you can use tomorrow or of course you can freeze them. But the key is not to waste a scrap. 
to remove the breasts. One breast here, one there, and the breast bone. You can just see the line of it there running up. And then just cut through the skin. And that's going to make it easier for me to see where I'm going. So I can see the breast bone there. The other thing that you see starting to appear here is the wishbone. That's that V-shaped bone there where the neck of the chicken would have been. And your knife slides down along that as well. Small little strokes of the knife. Again, keep going, always, generally speaking, always going south until you reach an impasse. And here we've got another ball and socket joint. To remove the breast from there, you just slide your knife in between. Jointing a chicken the first few times, you know, you may not get the most perfect, the most beautiful results, but it's a great technique because if you buy a whole chicken, there's no doubt about it that one of the ways of maximizing the value is to be able to joint it and then to try and make a full meal out of the breasts alone. Then the legs alone can become a full meal another day and so on. See where the wing is attached, just there, and put your knife just in beside it, cut off the wings and those you save. With a chicken breast, with the skin still on, and I'm leaving the skin on this, that is the fillet, that little bit there, which I'm going to cut off. Then I just cut in like that. Your knife disappears, don't panic. It's not gone too far away. Stop, have a look. I took my knife in about three or four centimeters and keep going, just opening it out. To cook them, I'm going to use a little of the olive oil I had dip it in the olive oil and then I'm going to put this skin side down first make sure your grill pan is hot it is like that same with the other one and leave it alone and now I'm going to go and wash my hands great okay now let's see how these guys are doing here I've got plenty of colour. Sometimes I move my grill around like that just to uh, spread the heat evenly. Because I left it alone, the meat shrinks up off the grill pan as it sort of caramelises. Lovely. Look at that. Perfect. So a little salt and pepper. I'm happy to put these into the oven. So lovely. So about 10 minutes in there and then we'll take them out. We produce our milk off grass in Ireland. Our butter has this creamy golden colour. The taste has always been pure. It's as natural as the day my great-grandfather made the butter. It's just so beautiful. So the grapes are cooked. Yeah, they look really nice. So at this point, they are just sort of tenderised. If I just squash them like that, see they're about to collapse? That's really perfect, okay? And the final thing I like to do with those before we assemble them with the chicken is just to put a little squeeze of lemon juice. So now the quantity of olive oil that I used, which may have looked slightly excessive, looks as if it makes sense because the olive oil, the juice that's come out of the grapes and that little bit of lemon juice that I've just added becomes the sauce for the chicken. I sometimes as well squash a few of the grapes to get a little bit more of the juice out of them. But as you can see here in my spoon, I've got beautiful, nearly amber, it's not quite amber coloured, a grape juice and olive oil. So it's like a sort of a vinaigrette, if you like, but the grapes have become the vinegar rather than a conventional vinegar. So that should be super delicious and super light. Quite, quite lovely looking. Our chicken, let's see how we're doing. Yeah, this certainly looks cooked at this stage. So what you're looking for is the, really the firmness of the flesh. And it feels completely firm when I press it like that. So you can do the old trick where when you bring your little finger to your thumb like that, and you press your thumb there just like that, the way the top of your thumb feels is the way chicken should feel when it's cooked. In other words, well done. That's also, by the way, the way a well done steak feels. So that's well worth doing that. And clearly no trace of pink there. At this stage then, to finish the dish, couldn't be easier. Pop your uh, chicken onto a lovely hot serving dish. And then we're going to scatter our grapes. So I usually serve plenty of the grapes. I serve all of these, really. I love the look of those thyme branches. If you think that's a bit too rustic, well then, you don't have to use them. So this is our sauce. I mean, the color is fantastic. To finish the dish, 
chopped rosemary. Rosemary is lovely with the sweet grapes, like that. And also a little chopped almond. So we roasted some almonds dry in the oven, and then I've just sort of chopped them or sort of sliced them. A little bit of rosemary, if you wish, just to make it look more like you've just cooked this in a wood or something like that. Very simple, very sweet tasting, quite light, totally refreshing. A few little new potatoes on the side, very nice food. I make a chocolate and caramel mousse that is a good deal richer and more complicated than the next recipe I'm going to show you. I'm calling this a whip because it can be pushed through a piping bag for its final presentation, in which case it resembles a chocolate whip. Chocolate and caramel, such a good combination of flavours, and this is easy to make. The long de chat, or the less appetising sounding cat's tongues, are light and crisp biscuits, and the crispness of the biscuit works really well with the light, smooth texture of the chocolate whip. Raspberries, when they're in season, make the perfect accompaniment. I'm going to start the chocolate whip by making a dry caramel. So um, I've got a heavy bottom saucepan with lowish sides, and this can seem a bit strange, but just put the dry sugar into the saucepan. And here, nothing's going to happen for a few minutes until the sugar starts to heat up and melt. Eventually, it will become syrupy looking in consistency, and gradually it will start to caramelize. It gets very lumpy looking. Some of the mixture will be caramelized, some of it will be looking like a clear syrup. It all looks very strange, but it actually all comes together perfectly at the end. Just at the very last minute, those last little bits of sugar dissolve out. And that's it. Okay, that's the chestnut color I need. Turn off the heat, immediately add in the cream. So I usually just dribble it in slowly. Be prepared for a beautiful, little mini volcano in your saucepan. And at this stage, you're delighted with yourself until you start to stir and you feel at the bottom of the saucepan bits of solid caramel like that. And you think, oh golly, am I in trouble even again? But you're not because we're going to just keep stirring this and that caramel will dissolve out. And also the mixture is cooling slightly because I want the mixture to cool slightly before I add in my chocolate and my vanilla. I'm using 53, 52% chocolate there, thereabouts. So not one of those really bitter 70 or 80% uh, chocolates. And I find the balance between that slightly less bitter chocolate and the caramel is perfect. I'm going to put my vanilla in with the chocolate so I don't forget it a little to lift everything, give a sort of a perfumed or sort of floral flavor if you like. There we are, and that's fine. And I think that has cooled sufficiently at this stage. Add in your chocolate and the vanilla, and you get this thick, shiny, beautiful chocolate sauce, which is going to be the base for our chocolate whip. Okay, that's that. I'm going to decant that into a bowl. Look at the color of that, isn't that fabulous? Gorgeous, sort of silky, chocolate, caramelly sauce. Last little bit. So that needs to go into the fridge now for several hours to chill and then we'll add the whipped cream a little bit later. So the cat's tongues. We make a simple sort of biscuit mixture really for this. And we start off by just creaming some butter, just softening it up a little bit. So it just takes just a moment or two. I tend to pipe these rather longer than a cat's tongue, so they look a bit more like lizard's tongues, but you may not want to call them that because it doesn't really sell them in terms of something that's going to be delicious to eat with a chocolate whip. Right, okay, that's suddenly gotten lovely and creamy looking, which, and slightly sort of paler in color than it was. That's lovely. So in with the sugar, and again, just beat these before we add in the rest of the ingredients. Again, we're looking for light and fluffy here. Okay, that's pretty much it. I always reckon that when I'm there with something like this, beating it, I give it another sort of 10 beats, partly for penance, partly for good luck, and mainly to make the biscuits better. So there we are, just a little bit more. Right, the rest of our ingredients are some flour, which as normal, I like to uh, sieve in, just to make sure there are no lumps. Lovely. And then egg white, and that's what's going to give these little biscuits the particular lightness and crispness they have. Little vanilla for flavor. 
The vinegar could be replaced with orange zest, a teaspoon of, or lemon zest. That would be really delicious, actually. Now, at this point, see the way it looks kind of odd? It takes a moment for it to come together, but keep the faith. Scrape around the side of the bowl. Okay, that's lovely. And then pop this into a piping bag. Um, for this, I like to use um, uh, a disposable piping bag, but actually I keep the, the particular bag then for the next time I'm making long de shot. And I don't snip the tip until I've got the mixture in, because I want a very specific sized opening, about one centimeter is perfect. Squeeze the mixture down towards the bottom of the piping bag. You'd only be able to get so far before you get an airlock, but that's okay, because we're gonna solve that problem. I use a scissors and I want to just cut about a one centimeter opening. And then just pipe like that, a steady hand, all the way along. And it's parchment paper, because you don't want them to stick. Pop these into the oven, where they'll take about between 10, 15 minutes to cook. We want them a rich golden color on the outside and a slightly lighter golden color in the center of the biscuit. And that's that. In we go. Lovely. Great, so I've got some glasses ready that I'm going to pipe the chocolate whip into. So we've got the, our chocolate and caramel sauce, which essentially is what it was. And you see the way it's sort of solidified like that, okay? And all we need to do now is to fold in some whipped cream. Sometimes it takes a little bit of a beating as well. See, that's the consistency now. Your spatula doesn't quite stand up, so it's not set solid. And as you can imagine, the cream and the chocolate are quite a different consistency. So lovely moment when the chocolate starts to uh, swirl into the cream. So it's quite thick. There's always a moment you think, mm, I wonder, don't worry, keep mixing. So to keep at it, you get that single color. And then usually then I give it a little whisk. And that is that. I'm going to hang on to my spatula for just a moment. Give it a little quick whip until you see it's pipeable consistency. That's perfect. See, we're just holding its shape there. We've got thinking glasses as well, adding atmosphere to the moment. So this time I'm using another piping bag and I'm using a star-shaped nozzle. Because I'm calling this a whip, I like it to look sort of old-fashioned. And this star-shaped nozzle will give me exactly that um, look. So pipe all of the mixture into your piping bag. So scrape everything out, try not to make a mess. And then we have our long de chat course are really long delicate skinny little biscuits to serve with them and then I also have a little softly whipped cream and some raspberries so look at the quantity you have and decide how exactly you're going to fill this up so I'm putting a half a little freshly shelled sweet walnut on top just for fun you don't have to do that some of our lovely crispy, skinny, long de chat. And then off to the table with that. And if you don't get a resounding thank you from everybody you're serving that to, well then, you need to change your friends. Get closer to your cooking with Neff Slide and Hide, proud sponsor of How to Cook Well with Rory O'Connell.